You're like, oh shit, Tony's here. <laughs> well, luckily it's a welterweight, Tony Ferguson. So I guess uh, how much better is fight week this week not worrying about a weight cut? It's good, man. I had a slushie this week, which is pretty cool. And uh, I had a soda going into an elevator. And whoever has that picture, the fighter, sent me that shit because it was funny as heck. They were looking at me like, you're crazy. 170's home. I love it. So is this going to be the future moving forward, you think? Uh, this is where I hang my hat. I'm 14-2 and two with mostly knockouts at 170. So, like I said, it's where I hang my hat. And 155's home, too. So uh, I'm here to collect. Last fight, obviously, man, everything was going great until it wasn't. I'm just curious, I mean, knowing the effort that you put in and how good you looked, how difficult of a result was that for you to kind of accept? Not really. I don't remember being on the stool. I remember him getting his hand raised, talking to Chuck. I remember walking out towards the ambulance, and I was like, oh, shit, yeah, you lost. Ah, oh, fuck. Went back to the drawing board. For two months, I started lifting heavy, real heavy, because I knew what I was going to do subconsciously. So I was like, okay, cool. Talked to the brass. We said it was cool for 170 or 155 pounds, whatever I want to do, shot call. And uh, they had an opportunity for me, so I took it. You know, went to Jackson Wing for this camp. I went for Black House a couple times, but most of the time, all I did was I took these opportunities how I needed to. Um, I stepped in a cage for the practice room for the first time in about five to six years. I mean, it's been a while since I practiced in a cage, guys. I've always been on a mat, and it's been the first time I sparred since five or six years as well. So it's a little bit more interesting. I've been doing this by the, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know by the sweaty balls, I guess you would say, and just going in there and doing the shit. But uh, it's different now. I put deodorant on, we're, all, we're cool now, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're cleaning it up and we're going in there and we're gonna have some fun, man. You guys are gonna see old school tea. And not talking myself in the third person either. <laughs> oh, but we like that. Oh, what, what, what is the plan moving forward for your training? Like you said, you got some different looks and stuff. I mean, do you think that's kind of the, the idea is to just move around or is it to set up a home base somewhere? What is the plan? No, man, I went fishing. And what I got was a bunch of trainers that I believe in. Uh, I've always had my eyes on a couple of these people, like just a scout. I'm a scout. I know what the fuck to look for. I've been playing sports for 30-some years, 34 years. I've been playing sports at a high level. And the last time I put a great team together, we went on 12-5 12, 12, victories. And we just made it happen. We started at a park, went to Big Bear, made up my compound. You know, and I had trained out of my garage for Khabibur at UFC 209, scared the shit out of that dude. And you know what I mean? We're just putting all the pieces together. And this is like not a final piece, but what this is is like that part of the puzzle that you just keep, oh, I, that, you know, the frame is done. Oh, cool, now I can work on the inside, I can do all this stuff. And I got some really good people that are helping me open my eyes with some things that I cannot see, is which is the trust. And it helps to be able to be in an octagon, get some sparring in, and get the great training that I really need. Nice. Lee Jingliang as, as an opponent, break him down, what do you see, what kind of challenges does he present for you? Uh, Lee likes to scrap, man. He likes to go in there, obviously he knows I like to scrap. We're gonna go in there, we're gonna, we're gonna impress a lot of people, toe to toe, balls to the walls, and we're gonna go in and make some fireworks for you fuckers. Last thing for me, what is success here for you, Tony? I mean, is this all about you know, results oriented? It's gotta be a win? I'm trying or? to cut swearing too, by the way, guys. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> 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 Fuck! <laughs> but what, what is success for you? I mean, can you go in there and like you said, know that you have a great performance, know that you have a great fight, come up short and still feel good about it? Or is this like, no, we gotta walk away with the win this time? Oh yeah, you asked something about Chandler, I forget. Uh, going into the Chandler fight, uh, cool little secret, I was looking for an outside sweep single. I was looking to bait him. I didn't even throw a punch. I was like, I'm going to take this fucker down and uh, just finish the fight. And this, uh, it didn't really work, man. I was looking and I was paying attention to the wrong leg. I didn't, I didn't pay attention and obviously got booted. In the first round, though, we were picking him apart. The idea was to check all of his kicks, and I did. You asked that son of a bitch if his legs hurt after the Gaethje fight and after my fight. Yeah, it's a little bit different. The only part of his foot that didn't hurt was the bottom of it, and he got a couple of those eating in the first round. So I guarantee you in the corner he went back and he's like, fuck, because he even said he doesn't throw that kick, right? So in wrestling, that's called mirroring. And uh, he did it, I got caught with it, and uh, shit, shit happens, dude. You know what I mean? Props to him. And I use this analogy that I've been helping people up from where their level has been. When I first took the fight with Gaethje, preparing for a grappler for half a year, taking a striker fight, it's kind of like the same thing with the Landon Venata fight. Like, what the fuck? Oh, here we go. I guess I guess there was only a striker, you know, and shit happens with the UFC. They like to make the matchmaking. They like to switch things up. But it, essentially what it is is on the fighter to always be ready. And that's how I am. They can trust in that. And they can trust me to bring back sports in the pandemic. So why not go up to 170, handle business and uh, come out with my hand raised in victory? Tony, over here. After the Michael Chandler fight, you went and you spoke to a few of the media and you, you sounded really positive about your performance. Was there something about that first round that reminded you you could be competitive with the best in the world that proved to you that, that you're still on the right path? Fuck no. I know I'm always on the right path. 
I'm going to be real. Uh, I've come to to uh, consideration of what I really needed to do. Uh, I mean, I have a football ring right here, and I was going to say the, the two years that we've played over, I played varsity for a long time, but the junior and senior year, we were 27-1, and one, and we won state, and we almost came back to being back-to-back -back champions. Shit happens. It was one of those things where you take those learning experiences, and sometimes you can't get it back. Your senior year, you can't go play back, you know, unless you're going at a higher level. For me, I have all the, the trophies and the medals and all the charts and everything, you know, the ultimate fighter trophy. I have a, uh, you know, fighter's award trophy. I have a belt. I have the titles. I have these things. You know, the Hall of Fame is right there, but I'm considered already fucking in it. When that time comes, it's always looking for something to be better at or to have another goal. I haven't looked at that new belt like it was something I wanted for a very long time. And I started watching a lot more film and kind of like seeing everybody get that belt because I'm an old school guy. I love to get all the old school stuff and, you know, it's collecting checks and choking necks all day. So I'm here for the right reason. When you look at the welterweight division, right, it's always refreshing when you get to change up some of these opponents. Are there guys in that division you look at and think, that's a fun scrap, that's a fun scrap? All of them are fun scraps. Everybody's a little bit bigger. I'm faster and I'm stronger. So they're going to have their hands full no matter who's in front of me. And, you know, this weekend is Li Jing Liang. So we'll try there. We'll start there. And we're going to come out with our hand raised to victory, man. He's going to have a long ride home. Obviously, you know, at 155, this fight between you and Conor McGregor was always discussed. Do you think that's just behind you? Nick Nuggets. Do you think that lost the sauce? Do you think that was just completely gone, or is he now going to be at 170 and you can bite there? Or how do you think that one? Goats come and go, but boats stay float. I'm a boat. I'm the best of all time. You know what I mean? That's a title that won't go anywhere. I'm always going to be the fucking champ. Nobody's going to ever do what I have done for this sport. I brought back sports for the world, man. And that took a lot of balls, and that took a lot of teamwork from, from my management, Dana, and just anybody else who was in that for the last that three days trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And to see that from how we are now and just kind of like just paving the way for everybody, everybody loves this fucking sport, and I'm very glad that they do because we work fucking hard, man, in this sport. I can't say anything about boxing because I'm not a professional boxer, but I see them training just as hard. And uh, if you're in a high-level competitive sport, you better love that shit, man, and, and try to figure out what you really want to do. And I've got what I want to do. Last one for me. Great main event on Saturday. I'm curious how you see the fight between Nate Diaz and Shabab going. Double knockout. <laughs> they knocked each other the fuck out. Tony, anyway, um, you said you were, we, should, we should expect to see the old T's. I see you dyed your hair. Is that part of it? Because like, you did that for years. I was uh, just going too fast. The color faded. And, uh, you know, I can't really do anything about it. Uh, you know, it's something different. Like I said, I've always done it, and people just have uh, jocked my style for a long time, and I stopped doing it. You know what I mean? I'm a cool guy, and when somebody does something cool like I do, I'm going to be like, eh, fuck it, I'm going to go do something else. And it's just not following trends. It's not doing anything else but just being me, and I like being me. 170 pounds, 155 pounds. Last time I scolded everybody, you know what I mean, which was cool. I don't have to do that. I said my piece already. I don't have to be an asshole. I can go in there and do what I want to do because I do what I want, and it's because I work my ass off. I love Vegas. I love how it is. It's Vegas strong all day long. And uh, I'm here and happy to present myself at UFC 279. So when you see Charles Oliveira's hair dye, you're just like, I did that first? No, nah, I don't really care. He's my student. And if you realize that, I, like I said, I did zero jiu-jitsu preparing for that kid. You know, and that was a funny one. But that was during pandemic. It was some just random shit. It didn't happen. Um, hey, can you guys make it? No, nah, man, I'm across the state. All right, shit, fuck it, whatever. I'll see you guys sometime. And just making it happen, just trusting in my training from Coach Eddie, which I did, man. That dude couldn't tap me out. It was crazy. When he had my arm out there, I was thinking of my kid because my kid's kind of not double-jointed in that shit, but I was like, fuck it, I hope I am too. And just making it happen, man, and just being and smiling throughout the whole entire journey. You know what I mean? If you're backpacking across fucking the, the whole entire state or running across it like Forrest Gump, you better enjoy some shit, have somebody buy you some new shoes. And you were pushing pretty hard to try to, I think it was to coach the ultimate fighter against Habib, like team versus team. Was there any We got the green light, bro. We're waiting on Khabib's fat ass. There's no, there's, there's, I, I actually called him Khabib. Did you guys hear that shit? We're waiting on Fathead's fat ass. And I'm going to be real with it. We got the green light from, their, from the brass. Went and talked to them. We got the green light from his coach. We got the green light from uh, his agent. His agent comes up and tries to hug me. He was all in pink. Fucking looked like Pinky from Friday. He was funny as fuck. <laughs> there he is, a bald head. And just you can spot him anywhere, and he comes up and he's like, "Let's do this." And in the reality, we're just waiting for Khabib's fat ass. So I mean, he's the one that's scared. Uh, regardless if it's a fight or not, we'll go and coach, and I'm sure we'll make it entertaining. I'm sure he's break. He'll break before the fighters are on that team. And uh, I still got some good material that I haven't used yet, so I'm just waiting for that day. Do you think you can be the one to get him back out of retirement during the season? I am the one to get him out of retirement. That dude's not retired. 
when it comes down to it, when you lose somebody, you have to take some time off. You have to think and do whatever you have to do. But his father had said that the fight to make would be myself and Khabib. And before he passed away, he did say that. And Khabib has that in his mindset. I gave them four fights of film. The idea was to take competitions and to be able to give him film. So that way he could feel a little bit more comfortable coming inside the cage. Because I did tell him one time, I was like, when you're locked in there, nobody can help you. And you guys remember when he surrounded me and my family here at New York, New York, which is a little bit crazy. I don't fuck around. It's the same fucking way. And thing with Khabib, if we do fight, that's for them. This weekend is at UFC 279 against Li Jing Liang. He's from China. He's a tough motherfucker, and I'm going to go in there and have my hand raised in victory. Ankle pick. Tony? Yes, sir. To you, right? Hey. Um, with you and Nate... Your other right. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> um, with you and Nate being on the same card, um, he said that he wanted to fight you. Was that fight ever on the table? I think it was. Shit, like I said, shit happens. You kind of just don't understand where the matchmaking is. They'll say that you got a fight, and then they'll give the fight to somebody else or whatever that's going on contracts. Um, Nate's cool. I'm going to be real. I have no guff against him. I mean, if we scrap, it'd be cool. You guys know what you're going to get. Um, but I got some respect for the guy. You know, we were ever at a fight in Anaheim, which was funny, because even before he called me out, he was like, Tony! And I was like, I'm not now, I'm busy. And I was walking off to an interview, and this time I actually saw him, and he was with his buddy. He tried to pass me a doobie, and I was like, no, 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 not right now, man. It's okay. We're at the fights, and uh, it was his friend. It was funny. We didn't say anything, though. And uh, I looked at him. He looked at me. And we're not trying to meme, but we're trying to figure out what the fuck somebody else is going to say or who's going to say hi first. And we both went, Pah! we gave a high five like this, and we bumped some chick on the head with our elbows on accident. <laughs> so it was kind of a funny moment, but that was it right there. And so, like I said, the Diaz has done a lot for the sport, and then, you know, they keep doing the same thing that, you know, everybody else does, but it's us big brothers that are leading the way to teach these guys not to be a bunch of fucking pansies. So go out there and don't tap and fucking come out with your hands raised in victory. Are you surprised you, you two haven't scrapped? No, not really. I don't care. I'm going to be real. When it comes down to it, I got to trust in the matchmaking. You know, Sean Shelby knows what he's doing. You know, you got Hunter Campbell and Dana White. They, they, they're a good team, man. They know what the fuck they're doing. So if they're putting all the pieces together, you know when they're fucking training or they're, they're making everybody fight through a logarithm. You know when they're doing it. I've been watching for a lot, like 10, 12 years. I've seen them go from shit, different kinds of commercials, from Fuel TV to Spike to Fox, ESPN, now Disney. I've said that in the last interview. I've seen them all. I've seen the pay increase. I've even helped pay increase. And just being there like, you know, like a fucking people's champ. You know, that's how I'm going to call myself that. But it's just like I said, that term champ, that's never going away. I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing to help the company. I'm not going to, you know, decrease value of myself. You know, that's not the way to do that is to get better, evolve, and make this place fucking awesome. You know, Forrest Griffin, perfect example. He's over at the P.I., you know, he was traveling around in the same car for the longest time. Everybody would say that. He's like, yeah, he won the car on the Ultimate Fighter, and he's driving right still. That was from season 13. Holy shit. So it took him, I don't know how many seasons, how many years to be able to get to where he's at. I started in the mail room, too, in the Ultimate Fighter. It was kind of shitty. But where I am now is a shot caller. I do what I got to fucking do in order to get shit done, and they can trust on that. Is that a new wrist tattoo? Yeah. So I got some feet on me, uh, not because of Chandler fuckers. Uh, this right here is my son, uh, Angel Anthony. And this is my son right here, Armand Anthony, my wife, Christina. So this is the family arm. Um, I like to fly, obviously, and you got the names right here. And uh, I have a rosary right here, one of my uh, good friends, uh, Father Joe, he's cool, as, cool, cool as heck. Uh, he's kept me in the game, man, which is awesome. I got a couple friends that are priests, which is cool. And I come from a Catholic school, Muskegon Catholic Central. And just surrounding myself around good people just helps remind me, man, where I come from and to be able to stay focused and, and to have somebody that has been there. He, he was in the Afghanistan war, and he got called in, the priest. And he brought his rosary with him, and he would say a lot of sermons for a lot of the different uh, soldiers, and he would you know, be on active duty, which is crazy. And I'm like, well, you? You a priest? He's like, yeah, I was there. It was cool. And he'd have a bunch of stories, which is cool, and I would sit there and talk to him. And I was at the church, and I asked him, I said, hey, do you have any rosaries that I can buy? You know, you know, just, I, you know, I have mine. I can't find it right now. And he says, uh, yeah, I'll be right back. And he goes in a couple of different places, and uh, he comes back in like, like 20, 10, 15 minutes. It was like for a while. He was looking for a while. Good guy. And he comes back, and he has one. He's like, here, you can take mine. 
He's like, this one's from the war. And I was like, oh, shit, thank you. I didn't even swear. But, yeah, I said, oh, shit. <laughs> and uh, what I ended up doing was I got the rosary on me. It was my last fight, you know. You saw me in the background, I was saying the rosary. It wasn't because it was just saying it. It was because I was reiterating what I was taught from, you know, the priest, Father Joe, and just putting it back in there, how I used to before football games, you know. We used to do prayer services or have full mass beforehand. And uh, it was a good reminder, and it was enough for me to be able to go and do that. And it was cool. So everything has a meaning. Tony, gracias por tomar tiempo para hablar con la prensa. ¿Qué pueden esperar tus fanáticos que te siguen, te apoyan, no importa triunfos o derrotas este sábado contra Jim? Estoy suerte para, yo tengo muchos fans para soportar uh, este, como, esta línea. Um, me da le duro todo el tiempo cuando yo estoy practicando, pero no hay personas que ver. Y entonces, solo una noche que todo el mundo ver que yo estaba practicando. Y es importante para yo, para ser mexicano, pero porque hay mucha gente en el mundo que necesitarlo. Y este fin de semana contra Li Jingliang, yo estoy listo. Estoy, estaba preparando muy inteligente con los otros gimnasios y mezclada todos los movimientos y las técnicas. Y yo estoy listo para todo. Te da un poquito de más energía, más énfasis que en esta misma ciudad ganaste tu título interino del peso ligero hace unos cuantos años sobre Kevin Lee. La gente, la gente en, este, en, en esta ciudad es muy, muy amable. Um, tenemos, tenía, teníamos uh, mucho duro en esta ciudad, como el mismo año, lo mismo uh, lo, como el día antes del, del Fight Week, hay un problema y, con los shooting. Y para yo es diferente porque hay una parte de la noche, yo estaba en el Walmart y mi familia está en el church, en la iglesia, y en la iglesia es al lado del, uh, como el shooting. Y mi, mi esposa le dije, uh, entonces me, nosotros vamos a, a la hotel porque el papá le quiere para visitar la music. Oh, shit. Uh, and I didn't know. Uh, y durante mi, mi trip, mi, mi viaje a Walmart para comprar las uh, comidas, yo tengo una llamada. Y le dije, mi, mi hermano le dije, hay una shooter, hay dos, dos shooters, uh, cuidado. Y yo tengo cinco miles um, de mi familia. Y entonces nosotros vamos, necesitamos ir al hotel para uh, encontrar mi familia. Y hay todos los calles están ciertos, uh, closed. Y entonces manejar arriba como las otras partes y encontrar el uh, uh, opening of the hotel y encontrar mi familia y yo ver la televisión y hay muchos problemas en el televisor en todos los canales y mi opinión para esta ciudad es diferente con de to, de, de las otras personas es diferente y mi opinión para esta ciudad es mucho fuerte y mucha fuerza y tenía muchas ganas porque hay muy duro en esa parte para ahora es diferente hay un edificio nuevo de Raiders en esta parte también hay una Apex y hay muchas cosas nuevas um, nos, nosotros estamos muy muy lucky I guess you would say que bueno man que tienen suerte y en sí, lo que estás diciendo es que aunque hayan cambiado las cosas, tenemos al mismo Tony y finalmente un pronóstico, decisión, sometimiento, ¿qué podemos esperar este sábado con tu actuación? Um, estábamos preparando muy inteligente para los otros gimnasios. En este fin de semana me voy a mezclar todas las técnicas contra Li Jingliang. Es diferente, mi energía es muy bien, 
estoy sonrisa todo el tiempo porque me comes todas las comidas ricos de español, eh, como los tacos y burritos y Slurpees from 7-Eleven, y como es diferente. Uh, 50, uh, 155 piso ligero es diferente para yo, para este de Welterway, esta es mi casa. Esta es mi casa. Es, es un lugar que me poner mi gorro aquí. Y en esta parte me voy a llevar la gorro y colectar mi dinero. Gracias, man. Y buena suerte el sábado. Gracias, gente. Compa. Tony, just one question over here, Johnny, with iHeartMedia Salt Lake. What's cracking? <laughs> Going back to your uh, amazing run on Tough 13, you finished all your tough opponents. You were so focused during that whole season. You'd show up with suits for before your fights. You also used to keep a box of dreams. Now, I'm just curious, box, you know, yeah. looking back at your amazing career, everything you've accomplished, did you accomplish those dreams? Yeah, I had to. My coach would tell me all the time, uh, when we first showed up at Grand Valley State, when I did, and he called me in, he uh, sat us all down, gave us a note card and a pen. That's Coach Dave Mills from Grand Valley. He says, I want you to write down three goals. I want you to write down one goal that you can accomplish within the first. And everybody, listen, I want you to do the same shit. I want you to write down one goal that you can accomplish within the first couple weeks here. The next goal is I want you to put another one in that you can reach within a half a year or a year. And the third goal, I want you to have one, regardless of what it is, big mansion or big expensive car, whatever it is, I want you to put that on there, whatever's unobtainable. And each time you complete a goal, you're going to get closer and closer towards that third goal. You would have put your quote of your favorite athlete, sign it, your weight, height, all that good stuff. But what was important was those three goals. And in the dream box, I would do that. I, I, would, I would put my energy and put my mindset on what I wanted. I would, boom, put that and put it in the dream box. And over time, what ended up happening was the dream box still there, but I started just keeping it inside, keeping it interior here, and not letting anybody do that. And I did that because it was my comfort zone. I never let anybody in my comfort zone. I said, fuck all you guys. But pardon my language, but it's cool now. I don't have to be you know, who I have to be in order to get shit done here anymore. They understand where I come from, and they understand that I have a lot of following, that we can get shit done. We don't have to be angry against each other. We can go out there and be civil and get shit done. If we have to be mad, whatever. Yeah, you see Cam's at. You know, shit happens once in a while, but, you know, if you're going to do something, you're going to do something. I'm that kind of guy to do something. I'm that type of guy. Awesome. Thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you. Sweet. Enjoy, guys.